Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds. Uh, my name is Amanda Duran. I'm the program coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. And OBCI is a partnership of about 100 different organizations across the state that support bird conservation. And we're thrilled to be able to bring you this series uh, once a month um, on various bird conservation topics. Um, for those of you that are new to our series, uh, we do post the recordings of our webinars on our website at obcinet.org as well as on our YouTube channel. And um, here is a look at some of our recently added videos. If you've missed some of our recent topics, um, we have recently posted how outdoor recreation can benefit birds, as well as uh, webinars on understa understanding how birds see the world and bird banding. And we also, um, through OBCI, host another webinar series on uh, wildlife for professionals. And if you're interested, there are some additional topics um, that we recently posted for that series, which are playing with fire, managing oak e ecosystems, and all you need to know about mute swans in Ohio. And those are also posted at our YouTube channel um, with the address at the top of that screen. I'd like to let you know about some of our upcoming presentations. Um, next month, we will be having a presentation on Green Lawn Cemetery in Columbus. Um, some of you that may not be familiar with that cemetery, it's a park cemetery. So it has um, some exceptional birding opportunities right in the heart of Columbus. It is an important bird area. So we'll be learning um, from their land manager about um, the park itself and its history, as well as its importance to birds. And then in October, we'll be having a webinar on the importance of keeping cats indoors from um, the American Bird Conservancy's leading expert on keeping cats indoors. So please do join us um, for that webinar. And then um, we'll be followed by a webinar on wild turkeys. So for more information about all of those topics, please visit us at our website at obcinet.org slash lunch with the birds, where you can also sign up um, to be on our mailing list to learn about our upcoming webinars. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's webinar, Global Conservation Connections, and invite you to go to their website where you can learn more about their mission to solve environmental problems through sound science, conservation education, and sustainable living. So with that, I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Rachel Hefflinger is a newly hired environmental education specialist at the Metro Parks of the Toledo area. She attended OSU and studied forestry and wildlife science, graduating with a BS in natural resource management in 2014. Um, while she was at OSU, she studied sustainable agriculture in Ecuador, as well as completing an avian research project in the Guangxi province of China. She studied at the Stone Lab on Gibraltar Island for a summer and worked under Dr. Stanford studying predatory bird interactions with the Lake Erie water snakes. She was then brought on board to study the effects of emerald ash borer across Ohio, working under Dr. Kathleen Knight of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, she now loves being part of the Metro Park system in Toledo and works to develop inquiry-based programming for all ages. She lives in Napoleon, Ohio, where she helps out on her family farm and organizes stewardship events in her hometown. She's very passionate about bridging the gap between conservation and agriculture, which of course is what she's going to be speaking about today. And in her free time, she likes to hike, bike, and take naps. So um, with that, I'm going to switch it over to you, Rachel. All right, so you should be the presenter now. And uh, just before we get started, a reminder to everyone, if you do have any issues um, with your audio connection, um, I would encourage you to close any other internet browser windows you have open, as well as any file sharing programs you might be using. And if you have any questions for Rachel throughout the webinar, she will be taking some breaks uh, for questions. But um, go ahead and send those to me in your chat box, and I will um, share those with Rachel. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, like Amanda said, I uh, live in Ohio, and um, Napoleon, Ohio, uh, which is where I actually grew up. Um, I grew up on my family farm. My mom's side has apple orchards, peach orchards, as well as a large um, boarding stable. And my dad's side uh, typically rents out their cropland for tenant farmers using uh, cash crops such as soybeans and corn. So I have a big background um, in agriculture. It's how I was raised and um, one thing I, I'd like to always share 
is that um, although many people think that agriculture and conservation typically butt heads, uh, I like to think differently. My grandfather uh, always said, we are only given so much land, once it's gone, there is no adding more. And um, yes, folks, he was a farmer, so he had a great respect for the land, and I think a lot of farmers, um, even today, have so much respect for the land that they're working on. And so we need to remember that when uh, doing conservation efforts. Um, like I said, I am a part of the Metro Parks of the Toledo area, and our, um, our goal is to conserve the region's natural resources by creating, developing, improving, protecting, and promoting clean, safe, and natural places for the benefit of um, employment, education, and general welfare of our public. Um, uh, Lucas County is where this metro park is located and it has a diverse landscape um, from farming to also very urban areas. And so we strive to serve all of our public um, across our landscape. So, um, as many of you probably already know, not all birds make their homes in the top of trees. Many of our birds, especially our sparrows, as you can see from this list, Act, actually make their home on the ground. Um, and this can be problematic when we're talking about not only land management, but also farming. Um, uh, we'll get more into that, but I just want to point out that this picture is actually of a lark sparrow. And while lark sparrows may be very prevalent in other parts of the country, um, they are considered a species of concern within um, Northwest Ohio, and in fact, are only really found um, in f a few areas of Lucas County. But there are many other ground nesting birds as well. All right. The habitat of these ground nesting birds include open fields and spaces that have little to no woody encroachment. And I point that out because um, it's very difficult to actually keep trees out of a landscape. Um, they spread their seeds very easily. Um, and these ground nesting birds actually need about 20 acres of open space. Um, and that's how they judge where to put their nests. So if they can't find that 20 acres, um, generally they will move elsewhere um, or not be able to make a nest in that area. And the surrounding habitat also does matter for these birds. Um, as they're picking a nesting habitat, they typically uh, will not pick an area with a lot of woody vegetation surrounding it, um, and that's because that is where their predators typically live. All right, so where are these birds nesting here in Northwest Ohio? Well. Compared to the habitat that I just talked about, um, there's a t couple different types of areas that these birds may choose to nest in. Uh, that includes not only our parklands and nature preserves, but also agricultural fields um, such as hay fields, wheat, soybeans, um, and our open pasture lands. Uh, doesn't really matter what kind of pasture land, whether it's cows or horses, if it's large enough, our birds will typically go there. Um, and then this can also include uh, more commercial areas such as golf courses and airports. All right, so I'm going to get into to a little bit more historical land use of Northwest Ohio. Um, first, are there any questions so far, Amanda? Uh, no questions have come in yet. We'll give folks a second. If you have a question, go ahead and enter it in your chat box. And if we don't get it this time, um, if you can enter them as they come up and we'll um, get to them at the next break. But um, no questions now, so um, feel free to go ahead. All right. So the historical land use of Northwest Ohio, um, many of you might already know that we had two main great eco regions in this area, and that was the Great Black Swamp as well as the oak openings regions. And these two regions were vastly different. 
Um, the Great Black Swamp, as you can probably guess, was very densely forested. It had a lot of water standing in it. Um, it was inhabited by a lot of different large predators, um, and it was very difficult for us to, to move through. Uh, at, in comparison to the Oak Openings region, um, once the settlers came to this region, they were like, oh, thank you, because <laughs> they were able to get their, dra uh, their wagons through um, these fields much easier. As you can see from the bottom picture, it would be much easier to get a wagon through, and that's because um, it has a lot of sandier soil, um, so a different types of vegetation grow there, and um, it, it also didn't hold water like the Great Black Swamp, so it was much easier to move through. Um, however, the Great Black Swamp was, of course, drained, and when we did that, we found that it had very fertile soil for agriculture. Um, in comparison, uh, even though it was wonderful to travel through, settlers quickly realized that the Oak Openings region was not the greatest for agriculture. Um, in fact, it was described as land that could not be given away um, <laughs> because it was so hard to grow those crops that we needed in that sandy soil. All right, so the present land, land use of Northwest Ohio um, it's still very heavily farmed in some parts, especially that part that used to be the Great Black Swamp. Um, and in the improvements in farming have led to larger yields as well as yard, larger fields, um, as well as less turnaround between harvests. So these crops that are being put in um, are sometimes being harvested quicker, so any wildlife that might be choosing to um, settle in these fields are, are not perhaps not getting their full life cycle in before um, harvests are completed. Uh, improvements in farming have also led to the better ability to actually farm the Oak Openings region. Um, so you still within the Oak Openings region will see uh, farm fields um, as well as homesteads with pasture lands on them. Um, but recently, there has been an even bigger push in Northwest Ohio to um, develop the Oak Openings region. So although this land is not the greatest for farming, a lot of people still want their patch of land out in the country, away from the city. Um, and this is leading to quite a few uh, large subdivisions being built, um, which is causing our landscape to change from a very diverse community to, um, as you can see from the background of this slide, uh, mon monoculture Kentucky bluegrass. Um, so that's changing the landscape as well. All right. So the threats to ground nesting birds. Um, we have four threats that we're going to go over today, and that includes nest disturbance, faux habitat, woody encroachment, as well as nest predation. And this is actually a picture of um, our little lark sparrow nest with a couple of uh, young birds in it, which is, I really enjoy this photo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so first, nest disturbance. Uh, as you can see from these pictures, these nests are actually really hard to see in the landscape. So as you're walking through an open field, you might not even realize how many sets of eyes are on you um, as they're pe peeping out of their nest to look at whether you're a threat. Um, and so it's very difficult if you don't realize a nest is on the landscape, it's very difficult to, to try not to disturb it. Um, and as you can see uh, in that bottom picture, the birds themselves are very difficult to see, so you might not even realize that you have these ground nesting birds on your site. Um, but a way to mitigate this would be careful monitoring to discover the locations of the nests. Um, we have someone that comes into our park system and her whole job is to watch these uh, lark sparrows and figure out where they're nesting. Um, and really, she, she can't just walk through 
Um, she, she has to watch the adults and see where they're frequently visiting um, and then find a time to get as close as she can to make sure there are actually eggs there. Um, and she'll monitor the nest the entire time until fledging. And once the um, birds have fledged, she'll go back through with an orange flag and GPS um, where these nests occurred. Um, so it, unless you're, you're really working hard, it'll be difficult um, for landowners, especially farmers, to find all of these different nests in their fields is what I'm trying to get across. All right, faux habitat. And this is where our farm fields really come into play. Um, typically, these faux habitats are man-made, and they're used commercially. Uh, these are our pasture lands, agricultural fields, airports, and golf courses that I talked about. And the reason these are faux habitat is that these commercially used open spaces typically are, um, have a high intensity of disturbance. Um, take, for example, the top picture that's actually oops, on, on my, at my house. And um, on one side, we have an agricultural field. I believe corn was planted that year. Um, on the other side, we have pasture land. And in the middle, we have a stone driveway. And I cannot tell you how many times um, I have seen a kill deer or other type of bird actually lay their eggs um, in one of these three locations and unfortunately none of the birds made it to fledging. Um, so that would be a great example of faux habitat and that takes place right on a naturalist home <laughs> instead. So um, it's really easy to miss these nests and um, whether you're going through and mowing or um, in our pasture oftentimes we'll have uh, one of our one of our goats or horse um, step on the nests and then in the agricultural field specifically hay fields um, there's such a quick turnaround now between cuttings that these nests are not able to make it to fledging all right woody encroachment um, so in these open fields like I said they like to have 20 acres of open field in order to nest um, but in succession, we have a natural tendency to move towards wooded areas. And what I mean by that is after a disturbance, there are your first successional plants, which we think of in the prairie system, um, that can colonize that area first. Um, but then your secondary succession, you really start to get into uh, woody species. Um, and these would be your bushes and other brush. Uh, and then after that, you start to get trees into the landscape. And you can see by, our, by the below pic picture that um, that happens uh, in areas that are even managed because this was taken at oak openings. And there are um, aspen and other evergreen trees um, coming into this system. Um, and in order to mitigate that, you really need to have um, you have to have intense management, typically, to keep the woody, woody trees out of that area. Of course, you don't want to do this um, while, while the birds are nesting. Um, so that becomes difficult when you have several dynamics uh, when you're trying to manage a landscape. Um, so the reason these birds don't like the woody encroachment is because um, Brush piles and trees are typically good habitats for nest predators. Um, and we have several common nest predators that will go after ground nesting birds, like it's their job. Um, <laughs> and those include raccoons, skunks, weasels, foxes, and some snakes. Um, not only can these animals be going after these nests for food, but if you have a high enough density of herbivores, such as deer, um, you also have a much higher likelihood that your nest is going to get trampled, um, just like the example that my horse would trample a nest if it was out in the pasture. Um, this happens in nature as well. All right, so where does Metro Parks fit into the landscape? Within Lucas County, um, Metro Parks owns 
around 12,000 acres of natural beauty, and they manage uh, these acres in such a way that we have a diversity of habitat. But many of these acres are being restored into prairies and open spaces. Um, Metro Parks also works very hard to monitor all ground nesting birds uh, and works hard that the land management is not encroaching on their breeding season. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So I'm going to go over a couple of land management um, practices that Metro Parks does to manage for ground nesting birds. And then I'm going to talk to you about how this can be applied to farming. Um, so one of the practices that Metro Parks does is that from May 1st to June 30th, we close off parts of our park that we know that the nesting birds are located in, especially the lark sparrow. Um, and so if anyone is found within these parks, they are part of the park, they will get a ticket from our, one of our rangers. Um, but we also use this as an educational tool in a lot of our programming um, to stress the importance of not going off the trail, not exploring on your own, because there are birds that are nesting on the ground, and it would be very easily to disrupt one of those nests. Um, and so I think the major thing that we worked to do is to educate the general public um, because some people might not realize even that these nests are located on the ground. Um, all right, so out of the breeding season, um, Metro Parks also works hard to try to reduce the amount of woody encroachment on these prairies and open fields. Um, and we do this in several ways. Mowing is a great way. Um, it's generally low, lower cost, but it's, um, it needs to be done more frequently. Um, obviously, we cannot do this in the months of um, June to August, because that's when we'll find a lot of these nesting birds on the ground. Um, and from that previous picture I showed, you can see how these nestlings would have difficulty getting away out of the way of a mower. Um, so to try to reduce the amount of deaths, we try to have our mowing done, if we're going to do it, before March 31st. Um, and then we don't go back with the mower until August 1st. Now going back to the landscape use of Northwest Ohio, um, you might see how that can be a problem um, in large open fields that are used for subdivisions. Typically, these are uh, manicured lawns that are mowed every week. And so a poor baby lark sparrow that is trying to complete his um, life cycle and fledge out of the nest is not going to be able to do that in that short amount of time. Um, as well as in our agricultural fields, um, my family has hay fields, and if they are getting three to four cuts, that is typically around 30 to 40 days. Now, a typical lark sparrow, for example, would take 65 days to complete his life cycle. Um, so you can see how that, that varies and would not match up. Um, this goes the same for our prescribed burns that we do within the park. All burns are supposed to be done before March 31st to try to reduce the amount of um, deaths in our ground nesting birds. And um, we also are working now on reducing the amount of herbivores and the amount of deer. Um, present. And these deer, since they are so densely populated, they have to find food um, and that can sometimes be scarce. So if a ground nesting bird decides to put his nest in the middle of um, what looks like a very tasty patch of little blue stem, um, that deer might not care that he's trampling over that nest in order to get his food. Um, so another land management practice would be reducing herbivores 
and also population control of predators. Um, in our Oak Openings Park, uh, our raccoons are not only becoming a problem for ground nesting birds, but also our turtle populations. So um, basically, as is the rule, anything, everything in moderation is great, um, but when there's too many predators and um, type of one species on a landscape, it can start to cause problems for our other species, which um, is seen to be the case in a lot of our parks. All right, as promised, how can this be applied to larger and small-scale farming? Well, um, in our, uh, for example, let's go to the hay cutting. So, um, uh, previously, historically, the cuttings were only done two to three times a year. Um, however, thanks to improvements in um, both uh, farming equipment and um, our fertilizer application, you can get as many as four cuttings out of a field of hay now. Um, one way to, that this is harmful, as I said, it's not going to allow enough time between cuttings for these ground nesting birds to fledge. Um, so now there are some incentive programs um, that farmers who are producing hay um, can enroll in these incentive programs. Um, and what they require is that the first cutting of hay is done before June 1st. Um, and then the second cutting isn't done until uh, after August 1st. Um, so you would only get two cuttings a year, um, which is obviously going to reduce the amount of uh, cash flow for the farmer. Um, and that's where these incentive programs come in. Um, but the, the key is that there's at least 65 days between. Um, another good practice to implement is that if you ha know you have ground nesting birds in a pasture land, um, a lot of agencies recommend that you, you reduce the, the number of grazers to one to two animals per acre. Um, this is pretty common sense. It's not only going to help reduce the chances that the nest is going to be trampled by the herbivore, but it also helps improve um, the health of your animal. Um, you're going to, if you're rotating your herd, um, you're going to have a much healthier, um, healthier plants for the herbivores to eat, um, and it's just uh, less accumulation of parasites as well in these par um, pasture lands when you do this. So there are several reasons to reduce the size of grazing animals on pasture lands, but for our purposes, we're going to focus on just um, reducing the trampling of our nesting birds. Um, other good management practices are to reduce the excess mowing um, and keep that fence row clean uh, so that you can um, encourage those birds to nest on your, your acreage. Um, now, of course, many of you might know that uh, other, if you're going to manage for other birds, you don't want to keep your fence row clean. Um, for example, Bob Whites enjoy kind of a messy fence row because it adds added protection to them, for them. Um, so I would suggest uh, before you implement any changes to your landscape that you know exactly which type of species you want to manage for um, because it varies um, if you're going to go for a ground nesting bird such as the lark sparrow compared to um, if you're going to manage for Bob Whites which are a more recreational bird. Um, and then no matter what changes you implement, I would suggest that you remain consistent throughout the years because um, if you start to reduce your mowing and not harvest in those times of peak breeding season um, one year and then you go back to doing the opposite the next year, you're obviously going to have much higher mortality um, 
than previous years when you just consistently didn't pay attention to the breeding schedules of these birds. Um, so once you start implementing a program, it's really important that you keep with it and remain consistent uh, so that these birds know they can basically rely on you um, to manage the land for them. All right, so um, are there any questions at this point? Um, I had a quick question. Um, I had heard previously that there was an association between the um, nutritional content of the hay and how frequently it's harvested. Is that true? And is it um, does that lean more towards more frequent harvests or uh, more delayed cutting? Um, that is true. That it is it is dependent on how often you harvest it. Mm -hmm. And I. Uh, I believe that the more delayed cutting, you typically have higher nutrients. However, if you have a, a very wet summer, like we had here in Northwest Ohio, and you're getting a lot of rain on your hay, it kind of depends on the climate as well as the um, as the length of time. Yeah. Great. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and I have another question here. Um, under the incentive program, what percentage of the farmer's lost revenue is covered, and what is the funding source for the payments? Is that an NRCS program that you're talking about? Yeah, I was referring to NRCS. Um, however, there are some local programs that you can look into. For example, um, your local uh, OSU Extension might know of some programs, um, and typically it's a per acre program. Um, incentives. So uh, I was specifically researching one in New York and it was about a hundred dollars per acre hmm. um, of incentive that the the hay farmers would would get in return for implementing these programs. Great and sorry to speak where you're acronyms. located um, and the... I would definitely suggest um, contacting your local extension office um, or the Soil and Water Conservation District um, in your area to find out more about the incentives that are available in your area. Um, that's why I didn't mention spe specific ones because it varies by region. Great, and um, just for those of you that aren't familiar, NRCS is Natural Resource Conservation Service and though, um, that's a USDA um, Department of Agriculture program. So that is a federal program. All right. That's all the questions for now. Okay. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is in order to implement these changes, you obviously have to work with private landowners. Um, and coming from a farming background, I know that sometimes the way these topics can be approached uh, can be not. And I, I don't think it needs to be that way. So a majority of these habitats um, that these birds are choosing, yes, they have the option of choosing our metro park land or our state nature preserves, but there's a lot of surrounding habitat that they may choose to live in as well. And so um, if we don't educate these private landowners that they may have these um, critical breeding areas on their land, uh, there's no change that's going to take place. These The mortality of nests are still going to happen. Um, and so that's why I just want to stress the education part. Um, these birds are obviously important across the landscape. They do a lot of great things for us. Um, and if we don't have that ground nesting habitat, um, they will slowly disappear. Uh, and so I kind of already mentioned some of the incentive programs and we went over that. So if you are a large land owner um, and are interested in managing for ground nesting birds, I strongly encourage you to contact your local extension office um, and find out ways that you can do that as well as the um, your local soil and water conservation district. Um, these are great tools that you, you should be taking advantage of um, if you're if you're looking to manage your land um, more effectively for any type of wildlife, but specifically ground nesting birds. Um, and then the transparency part, um, I want to talk about 
is when you're approaching private landowners, if you're trying to get anyone to change a habit, you don't want to um, maybe give them false hope that they're actually going to be making more money by making these changes. Um, and you want to be very transparent in everything you say because uh, you never want to have a landowner come back to you and um, be upset with something that you told them was going to happen when, in fact, it, would, it turned out to be the opposite. So um, I think uh, along with education of private landowners, we need to have a lot of transparency. Um, the Oak Openings Regency Conservancy puts out this great book um, that talks all about living in the Oak Openings region, and it talks about the wildlife, the types of birds that live there, and how you can manage for that type of habitat. And so I think it would be great to have a resource like this um, all across Ohio, just explaining to landowners um, their almost responsibility or duty to the land and how they can help conserve this great place that we live in. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you're hoping to see change and you're approaching these private landowners, it's always great if you can offer some type of assistance um, besides just the incentive programs. But a lot of um, these changes come with quite a bit of work. Um, so if you can ever form kind of a, a group or committee that could potentially help to assist in these changes, that's always a great thing to implement as well um, because it's not only the landowner's responsibility, but I think it's everybody's responsibility to help manage for these birds um, and see that they continue to survive. All right. So small scale changes you can do. I don't know how many farmers we actually have in um, listening in today, but uh, even if you're not a farmer, another thing you can do um, is just manage in your own backyard. If you own a large patch of land um, and you would like to see ground nesting birds um, come settle there, I would suggest implementing no mow areas. Um, these are areas that will you obviously don't mow, so that's less work for you every week. Um, but you also would plant native grasses and um, sedges and all different types of things that could potentially uh, encourage these um, ground nesting birds to settle. Uh, and then, of course, that consistency, once you decide to make it, that a no-mow area, um, please continue to do that. Don't change your mind after... Um, four or five weeks and decide to mow that patch because uh, that would definitely increase our mortality. Um, reduce the number of trees in the landscape. Now, I was a forestry major, so obviously I love trees, um, <laughs> but I have to recognize the importance of these open spaces as well because like our lark sparrow, they're not going to enjoy having a lot of trees in their landscape. So if you're managing for an open prairie system, make sure you are consistent with that and reducing the number of trees that are coming into that system um, so that it, when the bird is flying overhead, it continues to look like a good nesting habitat for that bird. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, if they see a lot of woody encroachment, they are going to choose not to settle in that area. Um, and then another small, I would encourage you guys to explore your land. Um, if you own a big backyard and you never step outside of it, um, I would encourage you to go out with a pair of binoculars and look for these ground nesting birds. Um, maybe they're already settling in your backyard. Um, like I said, these nests are very hard to see. So if you already know that you have these nests occurring um, on your land, uh, you, you really just have to make sure you're not disturbing the nest, um, you're not going out and mowing, um, and then you get to enjoy uh, having all these beautiful birds in your backyard. So there are there any other questions? Um, I kind of went through that really quick. I <laughs> 
sometimes speak too quickly. <laughs> so if you want me to go back over anything, I'd be more than happy to. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and enter those in the chat box. I just had a few things that came up in my mind as we were going through. Um, the first was um, you mentioned having no mow areas in your lawn, and that's something that um, is very appealing to me. But as someone who lives in a, a neighborhood and a development, um, I'm sure many of you on this uh, program today have heard um, in the news about um, the Ohio couple that decided they were going to stop mowing their lawn and all of the um, issues that they've had with their jurisdiction and with their township. So um, that is something I think it's important to consider. Um, and is that a, an issue that you ever uh, run into with people that have decided to do um, no mow um, in their lawns? Yes, I think it's definitely an issue that occurs. Um, I've never personally dealt with it um, because we don't have a homeowners association where I'm right. from. Um, but yeah, if if you know there is a homeowners association, before you implement any changes, make sure what you're doing is not going to um, go against that. Because like I said, the main key with a lot of these ground nesting birds is to have that consistency. Mm -hmm. So if you start doing no mow and then find out you can't, um, that can actually lead to higher mortality and you're going to do the opposite of what you intended to do. Um, so I think before you implement any changes, uh, you know, contacting local agencies, doing your research, making sure you can actually keep up with whatever program you decide to do, um, that's key for any land management um, changes that you want to implement. Great. I have another question here that uh, came in from Bethany, and she says, can you speak more to the ideal balance of, of mammal predators? We definitely have a groundhog, skunk, raccoon, and three to six deer that visit regularly in the evening. Um, okay. She's in a suburban area that borders a cornfield, and she believes she's seen some ground nesting attempts in the unmowed wooded area, but have these mammals pretty regularly around us. Okay, so... Um if, uh, I was speaking more of like in a park district when we, we basically know our population density. Um, having several of these animals is obviously just going to be the balance of things. Uh, but if you want to manage for ground nesting birds, um, you know, maybe you could uh, contact your, your local animal control agency and possibly have some of those um, skunks and other uh, predatory mammals removed. Um, I don't think the deer, if there's only a single deer, um, he's probably not harming those nests. Um, however, your, your skunks are voracious egg finders. Um, mm -hmm. So I would be surprised if any of those nests that you think might be occurring, I'd be surprised if any of them um, actually make it to fledging. Um, but you never know. I mean, nature's all about balance, so um, I don't know how big your backyard is, <laughs> but maybe uh, maybe some of these birds are making it, um, depending on how many, how many nests you think are occurring every year. Um, for example, the lark sparrow builds a nest and tries to um, raise a brood um, and it fails, uh, sometimes they can actually have a secondary nest in the same year. Um, so while it's sad that that, that nest didn't make it to fledging, um, it is possible for the female to, to try again and have another brood. Thanks. And, and Bethany says she has three quarters of an acre. And, and this is another, I live in a suburban area as well, and it's it's frustrating, especially because your options for um, controlling your predators are pretty limited in a suburban area mm -hmm. compared to what they would be in a, in a rural area. But anything you can do to limit the attractiveness of your yard to those predators, um, you know, skunks, for instance, are really attracted to grubs in your yard. Um, so if that's an issue that you have, um, trying to get rid of anything else. You know, raccoons are often attracted to open bird feeders that are um, not covered. So just things like that to make your yard, you know, less appealing can help as well. 
and Rachel, I just wanted to um, point out how good I think it was that you emphasized the how you have to decide what you're going to manage for because as soon as you said keeping your fence rows clear the first thing I thought of was bob white and how they always say messy fence rows are great for bob white but of course I hadn't thought of it on the flip side so it's it's important to realize you know, all all wildlife have different requirements and, and that's how we're, they're able to coexist on the landscape but if you have one in mind um, realize that you're not going to be able to manage your yard or your property in a way that benefits everything. So to prioritize what you are focusing on is important. So thanks for emphasizing that. Yeah, and that's that's the same with the um, predators, the predatory mammals as well. Like um, I, if you're if you want to see those in your backyard, um, mm -hmm. then obviously you'd manage differently than if you were managing for ground nesting birds. So if you're going to make any changes, definitely have a goal in mind before you even start researching your options. Uh, one other thing that came to my mind as you were speaking, you mentioned airports as um, kind of a faux habitat. And there's a, a really cool project I wanted to let people know about that's going on in the Dayton area with Allwood Audubon Center. They're working with the Dayton Airport to actually reduce mowing and manage for grasslands in some of their areas surrounding the airport. And they've had some really good results with not only um, increased numbers of grassland birds nesting, but decreased numbers of what they consider nuisance birds, so grackles and, and um, Canada geese and other birds that lead to collisions with um, aircraft. So if you're interested in that, I uh, encourage you to Google it. There's been some pretty interesting articles, including one in the Audubon magazine about that project. So another example of how we can um, reconcile these different pressures um, of commercial and um, conservation Okay, any other questions here before we wrap up? Feel free to enter those in the box. And then um, just as a reminder again, please um, visit our website to sign up for our next webinar, which will be um, in September 16th at noon again, and that will be on um, the history and birds of Green Lawn Cemetery. So any other questions before we go? Okay, well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the program. Rachel, thank you so much again for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Hope everyone else did as well. And um, hopefully I'll see you back here again next month on an upcoming webinar. Thanks, everyone.